Well, good morning, everyone. So glad that you are here. Uh, so thrilled that you are joining us. Thanks for hanging out with us this Sunday morning. If you're tuning in online, we are glad that you're here as well. I'd love to know where you're watching from. So go ahead and throw that in the chat. We'd love to say hi. Uh, but we're just so glad that all of you are here. Uh, grown-ups, kids alike, welcome. We are continuing and wrapping up, actually, uh, this series called Mindset Reset, looking at how are we transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we step into the practices that God talks about in the New Testament specifically about how our life can be dramatically changed, not just like a little bit improved, not just like a Jesus add-on, but like a whole new you. Uh, how, how do we actually see that happen? And the Bible says that starts with how we change the way that we think. Think about God, think about ourselves, think about the world and the circumstances around us. And so throughout these last four weeks, we have had this kind of living metaphor that we've been exploring, which is why you got that sticker on your way in. And if you didn't get one, we'll get you one on the way out of these caterpillars. And if you remember the first week, they were like so teeny tiny. And then they got really big and fat and crawly. And last week, they all got into their chrysalises, chrysalis, whatever, whatever the plural of chrysalis is. Correct me in the chat online crew. You can look it up. Uh, and now I'm just really hoping that like mid-message one just emerges <laughs> and it's just like perfect. So that's my birthday wish. You hear that? All right. So, um, but it's just this idea, right, of, of the caterpillars. They, they do what's natural and normal to them. And then they kind of surrender and give themselves over to this process that is still them, but also something totally other and different and better and more beautiful. But that, that was in their DNA. It was how they were wired and created to be all along. But there was a process to get there. And the same is true for you. The same is true for me, that there's a place we start and there's an idea and a hope and a desire of a place that we'll get to eventually. And there's kind of some steps along the way, some very natural seeming steps and then some very supernatural steps that we have to kind of surrender to. But that all along the way, God invites us to play a part in the process of our own spiritual growth and that our minds, our mental health, our resilience, the way we think, it's a huge part of that. And so whether you're a second grader or if you have a second grader, whether you're a senior in high school or a senior adult, we are all invited to continue to take the next step to discover how to integrate our minds into our spiritual transformation. And actually, when Jesus was asked what's the most important thing, he made sure we knew this. I don't know if you've ever been asked, like, what's your favorite thing? Or what do you want to be when you grow up? And you have this one thing in your mind, you're like, this is really, really important to me, when I was in elementary school, I wanted to grow up to be a professional roller hockey player. Because at the time, there was a professional roller hockey league. But by the time I got out of high school, that league was no longer available. So the good news is, is I got drafted. But there were no teams, right? So uh, I changed careers. So anyway, but I don't know what you were thinking of when you talked about that. I don't know if there's a moment where you're like, what's your favorite food? You're like, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it comes quick. Maybe you have to think about it. But when Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing to God, right? Big question. I don't know if you ever thought about it. If you had to answer what's most important to God, what would you say, right? But Jesus says, actually, it's, it's very simple. Not easy, but very simple. In Mark 12, he responds to that question saying, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, there it is, and your strength. And in the first century Jewish audience, they knew that what they meant is the heart is how you think and feel about the world, right? Your soul is the integrated life, your full self, right? Your mind, how you think about the world, the thoughts you have, cognitive and subconscious, and your strength, your body, this agent that we are given to live and move around our human experience in. He says, you to love God with all of that. The greatest thing for you to do is to learn how to integrate your love for God in every aspect of your life and the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, no other commandment is as important, is greater than these, right? So again, it's not just our mind like learning more information, right? The American church loves to place disproportionate focus on learning new information. But to Jesus, what he means by, and, and other first century readers, right? How they would interpret mind is how we adjust our operating system of our life to match the way God sees the world that how we adjust the way we see the world would begin to match as we love and follow Jesus more and more the way that God sees the world, right? That how we perceive ourselves, others, uh, the world around us, other people that we like, other people that we don't like so much, how we internalize and interpret our circumstances 
all of that would be in the world that we create in our minds would show up in our life so that we can make the world a more beautiful and better place the way God ultimately intended it by stepping into it ourselves. And so the Apostle Paul, who was a follower of Jesus, he actually encouraged other new followers of Jesus to do that same thing, to step into a new way of thinking so that they would begin to have a new way of living and change the world around them to look more like the way God intended. So he writes to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, which is kind of in our anchor passage for this whole series. He says, there's kind of two ways you go about your life. There's not really a ton of neutral, right? You're either going to copy the behavior and customs of the world, or you're going to follow God. He says, so don't. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a whole new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because isn't it true that the way we think about circumstances, the thoughts that we allow, or the thoughts that show up in our brain, really determine outcomes of our life. They, they really can shape our relationships, our finances, our faith, our fear, right? How you and I think about things really, really matters. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my brother is here, which is fun, we were playing hide and seek uh, in our parents' house. We were running around and I found where he was. I was doing the seeking and he was kind of hiding in the closet door in my sister's room, which was the only closet in our house that had like an open door versus a sliding door. And so I just, as an older brother who is just a great example and loved him so much, lied and pretended to put her little desk chair under the door to lock him in the closet, uh, to keep, keep him trapped there. And I was like, Neil, you're stuck. You can't get out. Ha ha, sorry, sorry. But the thing is, is my sister's desk chair didn't really fit under the handle. So I just kind of put it there and made the noise. And so I told him he was locked and he just stayed in there for like an hour just waiting for someone to come get him. He was upset. I got in trouble. It was a whole great story. But that's the thing is just thinking that he was locked in there, he got to stay, right? And he was frustrated, even though he could have come out at any point during that hour, right? There was never a point where he was actually stuck, but he thought he was. And my guess is, is that you and I have spaces in our life, even today, where we're not actually stuck, but it sure feels like it. We've actually allowed ourselves to believe that that is as far as we can go or that that is just the way it's gonna be or that that mindset is now limiting us to play small or to stay in that pattern or to still succumb to that addiction, that there's no way to move past that because we have believed a lie unintentionally. And so my hope for today, and this is true for adults and kids as well, when we think about this idea of mindset reset, what are the ways that God wants to change our mind? What are the things that we believe, places we believe that we're stuck, places that we feel like we're just stuck in that chrysalis and there's no more transformation available to us? That's your cue, right? <laughs> Dang it, right? I'm hoping. I'm going to give them a couple chances, right? But, but where is it that we feel like we've, we've gotten stuck that God says, actually, you just need a shift. You need to change how you think. You need to have a mindset reset, an exchange, if you will. We talked last week that the way we can even navigate and control and, and move through the 60 to 85,000 thoughts that you might have in any given day, the vast majority of which are subconscious, negative, and repeating, right? It's not just to run around frantically chasing those thoughts and trying to like navigate, you drive yourself crazy doing that, but to actually create a filter, a mindset that helps you navigate and know what thoughts to listen to and follow and which ones to say, hey, that's, that's actually not for me. That's not of God, right? How do we know what mindsets to guide and to, and to follow so that we can lead our lives in partnership with the Holy Spirit towards God's pleasing, perfect, and good will for your life? All of us want that, but what are the ways that God wants to change our mind? Now, there are a vast number of personal specific, unique answers to each one of you in the situations that you might be dealing with or struggling with, and, and I would encourage you to find those. But my guess is they fall into one of the three categories that we see regularly spoken to, three major exchanges throughout the New Testament that God, through the writers of Paul and James and Peter and many others, remind people that are starting to follow Jesus of things Jesus had said and the three spaces that we need to embrace this exchange, right, that God wants to do in our mind. And I don't know if you've done spring cleaning this last month or not, our family has. And the first step of spring cleaning, right, is to get things out, 
to, to remove things so that new things can show up. And in our house, at least, new things seem to show up too quickly. I'm like, we just got it organized, now there's more, right? <laughs> where, where did this come from, right? So part of what we're gonna do today and the practice of this work as it continues in your life is gonna be to exchange, to take something out so that something new can be put back in. Because so often when we try to just add things to an old story, it doesn't actually rewrite it because that old thing is still there reminding us of who we used to be. So you have to do both, okay? So these are practices, right, that you were supposed to continually work these out in our life. But to go through these three major exchanges, these three mindset resets that followers of Jesus have available, you have these available to you right now, and you are invited to embrace and practice them. That's our work to do. All right, you ready? Let me say it again. Are you ready? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, making sure. All right, the first one is to exchange, to take away shame for belonging. To exchange shame for belonging. The prophet Brene Brown says that belonging is the opposite of fitting in. Right? The opposite of fitting in. As I turn 40 today, I think about my life. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think about... I think about my life, and uh, I, had a, I had a meeting with a, a mentor of mine about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, and I had just crossed over 30. I was like 31, 32, and he was coming up on 60, and I asked him, I said, what do you, what do you wish you knew at 30-ish that you're, you've now learned at 60? And he said, I think the difference between those two ages, and he quoted Father Richard Rohr, is you've stopped building the container of your life, and you've started to fill the container of your life. And he goes, and people mistake it for wisdom, but you kind of just don't care what they think anymore, which spoke to my punk rock heart, right? I was like, oh, I can, I can go there. That sounds great. But that's not as easy as it sounds, right? Because the, the tendency for all of us to try to posture and position ourselves to fit in, whether that's with people at work or people on your sports team, kids in your class, Right, to, to do what you think they want you to do or become who you think they want you to be, that temptation is real and it doesn't stop just when you get out of middle school. Right? And yet the opposite of fitting in is belonging. And that there's this, there's this thing about our human story where, where shame just begins to come on us like a garment. Like you put a shirt on in the morning, there are, there are narratives and thoughts and patterns that happen in your brain that just put on shame on you all the time things that you regret that you've done, things that you wish you hadn't said, spaces or whole seasons of your life that you wished you would have gone or lived differently. And, and for all of us, regardless of wherever we are, there are different things that we might feel shame about, but all of us let those things speak into our identity where we say not, oh, I did something wrong or I wished I would have done something different or no regrets, right? But that, that was a 90s reference for all those of you younger than millennials, right? But, but that that actually begins to, infiltrate and permeate our identity of who we are, and so we feel shame. We don't show up fully because we feel ashamed of who we are. And the scriptures tell us that this, this switch, the exchange we need to make, is not shame goes away because better behavior shows up, or that modifications of our life or performance is what makes the difference, but it's actually understanding belonging understanding that positionally already that is who you truly are because of Jesus and our job is to practice putting ourselves and living our life in a way where we understand that reality and live and step into that reality. The Apostle Paul writes to the first century Christians in Rome trying to figure out how to reset their brain from the life that they had known and living under Roman rule and customs to now following Jesus from a performance-based culture to a grace-based culture. And he writes in Romans 8, after giving this huge dissertation of theology, which is the first seven chapters of Romans, and he says, so with all that, if I had to boil it down to the most important thing that you remember, he says, so, therefore, meaning because of all that I said, now, because of Jesus, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And in case you missed it, he goes on to like list everything, earthly, heavenly, demonic, right? The things you can see, the things you can't see, the things you've done in the past or the future or the present. It says, actually, I'm just gonna list everything I possibly can. None of that can separate you from the love that God has for you and has already put into motion 
through Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. There is a positional reality in your life that you no longer have to live in shame. The hard part is practicing that true identity. The hard part is stepping into the truth spiritually of belonging and then socially of belonging, knowing that you are exactly who God's designed you to be. And as you practice that mindset shift, you begin to find freedom. Paul would say it this way, that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. You already belong. Kids, you already belong. Adults, you already belong. The next time you feel that showing up in your soul or, or in your body where you're like, oh, I need, to, I need to kind of turn it up to belong here. Or I need to do this so that I feel connected. I have to say the right words to appease them or to make them think that I'm, I'm okay. You can remind yourself. That can be a moment to remind you, hey, I need to exchange shame for belonging. That there's a shift that I already belong. Because the reality is that we see throughout the scriptures is that condemnation is not present in the presence of Jesus. Condemnation is not present in the presence of Jesus. And when you are in Christ, as the scriptures say, condemnation can't come near you. And that's what I've learned over this last decade, and I hope to live into even greater ways in the next one, is that I'm no longer having to posture and build the container of my life. And that brings new confidence and new courage and that's a mindset shift that the scriptures teach us we have available to us. The second one is that we want to exchange comparison for contentment. Anybody a big time comparison addict besides me? Right? Like comparison, I'm just always looking around like, what, what do they got? What are they doing? How much do I think they make? Right? Oh, I, I love that jacket. I wish I had one. Right? You know, I love those shoes, but I don't want to wear them because I always want to wear sandals. Whatever it might be, right? You have all the spaces in your life that you compare and the people that you, maybe you most likely compare to. And comparison just sucks the joy out of our life, right? Whether you're a kid or an adult, right, there is this, there is this drain that comparison creates that we don't actually want to live in. That's not a safe and flourishing space. And so when we exchange comparison for contentment, we actually choose to celebrate others rather than justify our own jealousy. And when you choose to celebrate other people, you actually make a shift rather than justifying your own jealousy, which sounds really harsh, but isn't that what we do all the time? Like, oh, I can justify my jealousy because, you know, if, if I had their job or if I had their upbringing or if I had her husband, right, whatever it might be, right, that we justify our own jealousy rather than celebrating others. And that when we do that, that shift, that releases the grip that comparison has on our hearts so that we can actually engage and experience contentment. Paul, the same writer of Romans, writes to Philippians, a new church in the city of Philippi, where people, again, are reprogramming their life. I mean, this is brand new information to them. So they get this letter from Paul as we put ourselves into the, the actual writings of Scripture. Like, this is the first time they've ever heard from someone about the ways and teaching of Jesus. And so they're going, okay, tell me what I do and what I don't do. Tell me what I need to let go of. And they recognize that Paul, in this moment, is actually chained to a Roman guard writing from prison. And he says this incredible statement in Philippians 4.12. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. Paul had been very rich and powerful in a previous iteration of his life. But as he began to follow Jesus, all that stuff began to matter less and less to him. He says, I have learned the secret to living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, whether with plenty or little. Do you want to know the secret to being happy in every circumstance? Like, that sounds awesome. I'm like, yeah, tell me. And then he says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, maybe you've seen that on basketball shoes or on, you know, fun memes that get posted around. And this is one of the most commonly quoted and most uh, least understood verses in the scriptures because what this doesn't mean is that, hey, you can do anything you want. Right? That's, not, that's not actually what it means. What he's saying is, given the context of his writing, right, knowing what it's like to have lack and knowing what it's like to remember having much, I can still choose to have joy and contentment in the midst of every space, that Jesus will actually give me that strength because I know what is waiting for me. I know who is waiting for me. I know whose approval I'm running after most clearly. I know that when I live in such a way that Jesus is at the forefront of my life, that gives me the strength 
to get through whatever hardship I'm in. So it doesn't mean that you won't have moments of comparison. It doesn't mean that Paul didn't have moments in that prison cell going, I mean, I remember what it was like to be able to go where I wanted to go, like do what I wanted to do, even have people ask me, how can I help you, right? Like, how can I serve you? He remembers that privilege that he once had and says, yeah, you know what? Remembering what Jesus has done for me helps me get through even this hardship, that when you have those spaces, right, where you want to have jealousy show up and you want to justify that jealousy, you can go, hey, I, I know that there's something more important that I'm living for. I'm going to exchange that comparison mindset for one of contentment. So we've exchanged, or we're going to work on exchanging shame for belonging, exchanging comparison for contentment. And then the third one is to exchange worry for peace. How do you exchange worry for peace? How do you, how do you get rid of, clear out the cobwebs and the old boxes in the garage of your brain that just constantly worry and actually fill those empty spaces with the peace of God, the peace that God wants to offer you? I don't know about you, but... When I think about things, potential futures, how a circumstance is going to go, what's going to happen next week, my first and initial reaction is always to imagine the very worst case scenario, right? Anybody else? Like, if I'm thinking about it, I'm going to think about all the ways it's going to go bad because I'd rather be prepared, right? And yet there was a study I read that actually when you imagine worst case scenarios, 98% of what you imagine and what you fear never happens, and 85% of what we imagine that could go wrong isn't actually even physically possible in this part of the metaverse, right? So, so we're just going crazy and using our God-given imagination to imagine worst-case scenarios. I do it all the time. And yet this is a shift I believe that God is inviting me and, and maybe you, if you're that same way, to make. I saw a post from a therapist I follow on Instagram that said, if you're going to spend that much time thinking about and imagining worst case scenarios, you at least owe it to yourself to spend a little time imagining the best case outcome. I thought that was so powerful. Like that's that muscle, that's that reminder, that's that intentional shift of going, hey, what might feel natural might just show up. I'm going to create a mindset, a filter that's going to capture that thought and say, okay, that's great. That may happen. Let's plan for that if you're that way, right? If you're wired that way. But also, what, what could go right? What could work out for your benefit? How could God's good and pleasing and perfect will actually show up, even in a circumstance that didn't go the way you expected? Again, Paul writes just a little bit earlier from the verse we just read, still in Philippians 4, still in bondage, still in prison, not able to do the things he wants. He writes this. He says, don't worry about anything. <laughs> It's like, oh, wow, just don't worry about anything. Thanks, I never thought of that, right? It's like sometimes you read a verse in the scripture, you're like, um, okay, get with it, right? Like it just feels almost off-putting, right? Yeah, don't be anxious, just quit worrying. If I could, I would, but now I can't, and now I'm worried about how much I'm worrying. Thank you for pointing that out, right? We have those moments where we can go like, oh, geez, that seems so intense. But when you put yourself in that scripture and you remember who is writing it and from where, and what they are going through, maybe, just maybe, the things that I'm worried about, the things that you're worried about, maybe there's something to say. It says, don't worry about anything, right? And, and again, in the original language, it's not a command. It's saying, hey, I know you're going to, but instead of doing that, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, but instead, pray about everything. That prayer becomes our first response when we feel fear, when we feel worry. That those fears that show up in your life, that space when you kind of like just get fixated and you have those intrusive thoughts that show up, you're like, ah, right? That that can actually be a moment of invitation and reminder to say, God, I, I'm feeling fear right now. To use the breath prayer that we talked about in week one where Katie led us through this incredible exercise of naming and noticing our thoughts so that that becomes a trigger, a reminder for us to say, hey, this is a space that I'm feeling fear. Maybe I should pray. Maybe I should engage with God, with the one who says, through Christ, you're going to give me strength. I want to pray. It says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. That gratitude becomes the antidote to anxiety. Right? It says, and then when you do that, you will experience God's provision where you get everything that you want. Is that what it says? It's on the screen, right? No, that's not what it says, right? Sometimes we feel like that's what it should say. That's what we wish it said. Maybe a preacher has promised you that's what's going to happen. 
Just pray, and then you'll get everything you want, right? That's actually not in the Bible, right? But when you do that, when you do pray instead of worry, when you do express gratitude, then you will experience God's peace, which goes far beyond anything we can understand, because you'll feel peace in the midst of an unchanged circumstance. You'll feel peace in the midst of an unanswered prayer. You'll still feel peace that's new when you go back to the doctor and get the same diagnosis. You'll have peace even though you didn't get the job, or she said no thanks, or he told you it's over, that you'll still somehow have peace in the midst of the loss, in the midst of the grief, because it's beyond anything that we can understand. And that God's peace will guard your hearts and will set up a perimeter around your hearts and minds as you continue to live this practicing, this step-by-step kind of life of going over and over with this new mindset, this new pattern, his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That when you exchange worry, right, when you exchange worry for peace, what God promises to do is to meet you in that space, to be a peacemaker in the midst of perhaps an unpeaceful circumstance in your life or even in our world. And I don't know about you, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with this, uh, you know, fake peace or faux peace that shows up quickly but then never really makes anything that changes, right? That overpromises and under delivers. But this counterintuitive transformational shift reminds us in our spaces of fear and other kind of anxiety-inducing emotions that we actually can redefine and recalibrate our hearts and minds and center our soul around what God is doing, has done, and wants to do in our life. That in the midst of the chaos and the swirl that you might feel when you're worrying about things, that to take a moment to have gratitude and to ask for what you need, recalibrate your soul and reminds you that what's going on in your life is so important, but it's not the only thing that's going on. And when we get that perspective, Paul says, that raises our eyes, it raises our frequency so we don't have to be anxious about those things. What he's saying is don't worry that you have to get it your way and that that's the only way, but that maybe, just maybe God might even have a better way. And the thing is, is that worry is actually a reminder that you are already good at this, right? Even though it's something we want to exchange, worry reminds you that you're already good at what Paul is asking you to do, right? Because worry is simply meditation in the wrong direction, right? Worry is simply meditation. You're focusing, you're fixating, you're rehearsing over and over and over again in your mind, but just in the wrong direction, the worst case scenario of what's definitely going to go wrong, even though we definitely don't know it's going to go wrong, right? It's, It's taking out of the equation any possibility for hope and joy and fulfillment and saying, it's only going to be that way. And I'm just going to rehearse it over and over again, which again, begins to shape our minds, which shapes our actions and shapes our attitudes to where it might even become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then we blame God, but we go, oh, actually the whole time I was creating that reality. And what if, what if we actually shifted? What if we did a quick exchange and said, I'm going to switch out worry for peace. I'm going to at least try it. I may not even believe it while I'm doing it, and that's okay. It's a practice to work over and over and over again in hopes that eventually we decide and realize that peace that God's promises all along is available to embrace. And that's the thing, right? These are practices. We have to remember that. And practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes progress, right? Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes progress. Progress, And so the idea that we have each week where it's a greater than, right? Something is greater than. These are the shifts we're making. Practice is greater than performance. Part of the best step you can make to have a mindset reset, to make this shift, is to actually acknowledge, you know what? I have comparison. Like, we never want to admit that. Like, that feels weak, right? That's kind of admitting that we're not all that we want to be yet. You know what? I just got to admit, I, I worry too much. You may not think you do, but everyone in your life will tell you if they were honest, yeah, you worry too much, right? That, that you actually live with shame about yourself for some reason or for some thing or around certain people. Admitting where we actually are is an incredibly powerful step because often, unfortunately, 
we're prone to simply perform our way out of wherever we are or to think we can or that we ought to. And the imitation throughout the entire New Testament around this idea of mindset reset is that practice is greater than performance. Starting where you're at, taking a step, taking that same step again, taking another step, that over and over, that repetitious life of practicing these shifts is so much better than trying to perform it and get it right all the time. So as we end this series, that's my prayer, right? Is that you and I would begin to practice these three shifts. Shifting our mind from shame to belonging, from comparison to contentment, and from worry to peace. And I believe that as we practice, as we do that, these mindset resets will lead us closer and closer into living along the way the abundant life that Jesus promises. And so as you leave, if you haven't yet, get one of these stickers. Put it where you can see it. Put it on your notebook or your laptop or your water bottle. Put it on your fridge. Put it on your mirror. That's going to remind you and, and be a cognitive space that says, hey, remember what we learned. Remember what we discussed. Remember what God did and wants to do in and through your life as you shift. For some of you, the best place to put it, like I said, might be somewhere that's private, and maybe it's somewhere that maybe others will see it, because the shift you need to make is to know that there's a space to share your story, whatever it might be for you, right? That you would experience the abundant life that Jesus offers, because we intentionally practice these three shifts. You're going to have good days, and you're going to have harder days. But the mindset shift is always available to every single one of us. So I'd love to pray for you and just ask the Holy Spirit to do far beyond what I could do with my words in and through our lives, and then we're going to worship together. And when we pray around here, we tend to take a posture of opening our hands to God. Uh, and so I would actually invite you, though, to do something different today. And you can do this online as well, as long as you're not listening to this on the podcast later while driving. Don't do this. But actually, would you put your hands just kind of on your brain, on the sides of your head? I know it might feel weird, uh, but I hope that it's an intentional space to remind you of the space that God wants to renew you. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the gifts of our brains, of our thoughts, for the ways that they move our lives forward. And God, we confess there are spaces when they betray us and lead us places we never wanted to go. And so I pray for my friends here and for those listening online, as we even hold our heads, that we would begin to love you with our minds in a new way. And that may come through any one or all three of these mindset shifts that we, three, so we see throughout the scripture shifting. I pray for those who need to shift from shame to belonging. May they know who they are in you already and that you invite them to step into living in that perfect belonging. For those here that need to shift from comparison to contentment, that there's areas of their life where they're just never satisfied, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. That they would begin to celebrate others rather than justify their jealousy and they would find ways to let you do a work around the way that they think about their life, their stuff, their position, whatever it may be. And God, for those of us that need a shift from worry to peace, that our minds run crazy directions and stress us out and cause us fear, I pray that the next time we feel worry, we would feel it and let it remind us that we have access to a God who loves us and that your peace is available and that we would pause in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our stress, in the midst of our meditation in the wrong direction, and we would pray and invite you into that space and express gratitude perhaps of ways you've gotten us through it in the past or how you've gotten us this far. And we would recognize that there's more going on than what we're thinking about. So Jesus, renew our minds, transform our lives by renewing our minds. 
And may these three exchanges, these three mindset reset shifts, may they be practices that we participate in this week that lead us towards you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.